Earlier today, John Lawrence said that he's a big believer in crises for focusing uh, political attention and political will and getting things done. But as we've heard in that panel, the only problem with a crisis is you're not sure how it's going to come out. And uh, today we are really lucky to have with us someone who has um, lived through a series of crises in, in managing economic affairs and has a really strong track record of them all working out at some level really quite well. Um, and at a personal level, it's really great to be back with Lawrence Summers, who has served in a series of policy positions uh, that are all in your bio. But when you go through and see that he has been Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Director for National Economic Affairs for the President, Chief Economist at the World Bank, President of Harvard University, um, it's, it's really an honor for all of us to have Larry with us today. Um, moderating the conversation today is somebody who, for many of us, is um, a hugely important person, Bob Bruner. Bob has been uh, the designer of not just today's conference, but a series of conferences, events, classrooms, uh, classroom exercises, classes, uh, reading materials, teaching around financial crises. I have... Uh, two case study books that Bob has prepared on all of the American financial crises and some beyond that, that working with uh, the faculty who are here today who have been moderating these panels and faculty across UVA have been teaching as a cross-university exercise how to understand financial crises and how to act on them that bring together economics, political science, public policy, business schools. So for us, um, there are a few people uh, that do what Bob does and do it so well, and, and we are really proud to have him as a senior fellow at the Miller Center. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bob. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, to that uh, kind introduction, I would uh, like to add my thanks and greetings to Larry Summers, who in, in my mind is uh, a, a model of the the, the citizen, academic, uh, public servant, uh, obviously uh, in the memory of many of us here is associated with uh, challenging moments and policies uh, judged to be controversial in one quarter or another. And uh, yet uh, um, it's, it's clear that leadership, uh, among all the attributes of leadership, uh, one of them must be a uh, fearlessness in confronting challenging problems. And so our opportunity today is to consider uh, the context of the crisis of 2008. Um, he's had experience uh, uh, in, in the peso crisis of the 1990s, uh, been close to other uh, near misses along the way, uh, and he's uh, given a great deal of thought to the current uh, uh, outlook and uh, uh, situation that the United States and the world economy faces. And so the, our opportunity today is to plumb these various uh, topics with someone who had a place at the table. Um, I would also like to re-emphasize re a theme that Bill Antholis uh, sounded at the start of the day, which is that the aim of uh, today's entire conference is to is to try to connect dots among uh, crises uh, through time as well as crises uh, cross-sectionally. What's What went on in 2008, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere in the world? What's going on today, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere in the world? So we have an extraordinarily broad canvas on which to, to paint all together. And I thought what I'd do is launch a, a few questions at our guest and then pause and invite questions from you all in the audience. Your participation is vitally important, as has been the case in prior uh, uh, sections of our day. I'll, I'll invite two or three questions uh, in a bunch uh, and then let our uh, guest respond as he will. So, sir, welcome. Um, you were uh, one of the original architects of a a policy that's been dubbed shock and awe. Shock and awe uh, harkens back to the the, the phrase of the uh, the first Gulf War and the sense of just plowing into the adversary with, with incredible resources and, and force, but then applied uh, during the, the peso crisis. It, it uh, 
uh, brought to, to fore a very different set of resources than uh, the military might have figured. But um, take, take that uh, phrase, shock and awe. Did we bring enough shock and awe to the crisis of 2008? If so, why? And if not, why not? No, and then yes, and then no. Let me tell you what I mean. Um, if you looked at what was happening to the economy in 2007, if you looked at what was happening in the run-up to Bear Stearns failing, if you look at what happened after Bear Stearns failed, there was obviously a gathering storm, and nobody did much except react. Banks were allowed to continue paying dividends. Nobody was forced to recapitalize anything. Um, the situation drifted along. There should have been shock and awe of capital. I'm kind of credible on this in the sense that if you read my columns at the time, they were saying this. Um, and nobody did much. The Fed was sitting there, if you read their minutes, worrying about inflation and saying everything was going to be okay. And it was obviously a mistake. So no initially. Crucial period of six months between... Um, the time Lehman fell and the period after the stress test, America rose to uh, the occasion. The banks were substantially recapitalized. Significant fiscal stimulus was delivered. Substantial interventions to provide liquidity to the financial markets were engineered. And the sharpest V in the history of uh, the major economies was recorded between the first quarter and the second quarter of uh, 2009. So at the most important and at the most dire uh, juncture, we acted very strongly and uh, decisively and appropriately and effectively and that period after Lehman fell was by far the most important period uh, to get it right. Then um, the answer was again, no. Um, driven by misguided concern about budget deficits, uh, a desire to get to long run agendas, by the end of 2009, People were talking about working on long-term structural issues, addressing long-term budget deficits and the like, declaring that the green shoots of recovery were at hand, and the ball was dropped. And as a consequence, the expansion was substantially slower than uh, it could have been. And because it was substantially slower, it involved less capital investment, and it involved more people unemployed for a longer period of time who didn't come back to cast a shadow forward in terms of less ac economic activity than we otherwise would have. So at the most important moment, shock and awe was delivered and was delivered uh, effectively, but it was too long in coming, and victory was declared uh, prematurely. The latter error, I would say, was heavily in uh, the Congress and in the broad uh, public. I think res more responsibility for the former error rests with uh, the financial authorities than in power. So the reaction uh, against shock and awe following uh, the, the initial impulse is a, is a really interesting one. We saw the rise of the Tea Party, uh, the, the Freedom Caucus in Congress that, that was elected in uh, 2010, uh, the, um, the, 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 the drumbeat of uh, uh, 
revulsion almost to the to the uh, rescue effort, the, the rescues of financial institutions, et cetera. Um, was this uh, characteristic of the populist kind of reaction we've we've seen uh, in the wake of so many financial crises, or or, or was it something of a different uh, stripe? You know, somebody somebody famous, I don't remember who, said history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think that's about right. I think there are reasons rooted in financial crises and the need to provide support to the financial system after financial crises and the fact that there's lots of dislocation that makes it natural that there are pop populist uprisings in the wake of financial crises. You know, one can ask the question if more draconian policies had been put in place with respect to the financial institutions, would it have somehow curbed the populist pressure? The best natural experiment for that question says no. Um, Britain kind of did the alternative policy. They nationalized two of their four major uh, banks, and they kind of got Brexit at about the same form that we got uh, Trump. And so if you sort of asked, was populism meaningfully curtailed in Britain relative to the United States, they are having pursued the principal policy alternative. I think the answer to that question has to be no. There's a view, which I think is nuts, um, that, I mean, that view, you could argue that you should have had a different approach and been more brutal to selective ones of the financial institutions. That's like a reasonable argument uh, in my view, although I think the British example and other evidence suggests it wouldn't have been wise. There's a different argument, which is, you know, the government should have just stood back and let the fires burn, and eventually the fires would have burned themselves out and the economy would have recovered and taxpayers wouldn't have had to put any money in. That was kind of Herbert Hoover and Andrew Mellon's theory, and it was what made the Depression great. And um, it, if you look, uh, if you if you look at a graph of any interesting economic statistic from the beginning of 2008 to the beginning of to, to the fall of 2008 or beginning of 2009. It looks kind of just like the Great Depression did after 1929. And if you look at the subsequent five years, it, for the reasons I said, it could have been better, but it doesn't look anything like the Depression. You know, unemployment peaked at 10, not 25. That's very different. And if we had just decided to let the fires go, uh, we would have had something like the Great Depression. And by the way, if what you cared about was the government's revenue, the government would have lost 10 times as much money on the lost output and the decline from the Depression as it would have uh, gained uh, from not having to spend money on bailouts, most of which, uh, vast majority of which, uh, came back to the government. So battlefield medicine is never perfect. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, there are things you would have done differently. There are some details where... I probably would look back and say with the benefit of foresight, they sh only with the benefit of foresight, they probably should have done a bit differently. But the broad picture, I think you have to say, sharpest V, nothing like the Great Depression, that once the explosion had been allowed to happen, uh, the cleanup was really enormously successful. So you picking up on your... Uh reference to the uh, nationalizations in Britain. Should we have nationalized any of the financial institutions in the U.S. And, uh, that were struggling and that ultimately needed uh, financial support from the government? Uh, uh, a I case in point so. might be Citigroup. I'm not going to – I'm going to not talk about any specific institution just because I, I don't think it's the right thing to do for sort of obvious uh, reasons. Um, but I don't think so. Um, here's why. Experience is that, so what happens when you, quote, nationalize an institution? 
you say now the government owns it. And then the question immediately sort of looms, what are you, that's not going to happen forever, hopefully, so what's going to happen at the end? Well, you know, if, if the government's going to own it and the government's going to liquidate it, does anybody who's very talented want to continue to stay to work there? Probably not. Does, are you going to, if there's a bank that has a zero chance of ever giving you a new loan, how much of a hurry are you going to be to pay back your old uh, loan? Probably not very much uh, of a hurry. If you're an attractive customer and you're looking to choose a bank and the bank's kind of in liquidation and run by the government and it's not going to go anywhere, are you likely to seek to do business with that bank? Probably not. And so the experience is that government intervention in banks is invariably a major destroyer of asset value. So it would have been far more expensive for uh, taxpayers if the government had intervened uh, the bank. And it would have probably made the bank more bank intervened more of a zombie and less prone to uh, make loans and support the economy, which would have exacerbated the difficulty in the moment. Now, you know, there were people at the time who said, well, what about the Swedish model? Well, you know, there was a thing about the Swedish model, which is the government owned 80 percent of the banks before it all started and before it intervened it. So the government putting capital into a bank that it already 80 percent owned is a completely uh, different thing. People said, well, the FDIC intervenes banks all the time. Well, that's true that if um, – you know, if Summers SNL or, you know, Summers Community Bank um, gets itself into a deep mess, then what the FDIC can do is it can uh, intervene the bank and on a Friday and cause it to reopen as a part of uh, Bruner Bank on Monday and – Bruner Bank's got a management team that can operate it, and the deposits are still guaranteed, and the government has to give Bruner Bank some money, and then it's Bruner Bank's problem. Well, there isn't anybody sitting around in the middle of uh, the biggest financial crisis in 60 years who's in any position to absorb a big bank. And so then people would say, well, it's really anyway, yeah, maybe it's all a bunch of yeah, yeah from you financial guys, but... uh, Gosh, everybody deserved to suffer. Well, you know, if you if you were a shareholder in the banks that people talked about intervening, you, as of this day, after we've had a 10-year recovery, your investment is worth about 10% of what it was before the financial crisis started. So... In order to establish some theory of fairness that you should get zero, not 10%, you would have had to destroy an enormous amount of value, limit very large credit flows. So, you know, there's situations where that's what you have to do. That's what Ireland had to do. That's what Mexico had to do in the wake of its financial crisis. But a strategy of playing very hard to avoid that if you can it seems to me has to be the better part of wisdom. So you are a uh, big proponent of infrastructure spending. Uh, have been for for many years. You're blogging. You're you're uh, writing uh, your, your speeches. Um, what are the politics of that today? And and your latest blog post. Uh, uh, alarms us all about the uh, the prospect of a, of a of a recession around the corner, and uh, implicit in that is a, a call for the the virtues of uh, stimulus spending. Um, how how uh, how receptive is is Congress to that? Do you do you expect and or how receptive should they be? Well, I'm going to talk about how respect. Uh, I'll leave to 
political experts to assess how respect how receptive uh, Congress is, and I'll talk about how receptive uh, they uh, they should be. Look, it's kind of an extraordinary thing. Um, we are a country that can borrow money for thirty years at three percent in a currency that we print ourselves. It doesn't have to be an unbelievably valuable use that we put that to to make it worth borrowing money at what's likely to end up being a real interest rate of 1% or less. And yet the American Society of Civil Engineers tells us that the average American pays the equivalent of a 75 cent a gallon gasoline tax in repairs on their car because of potholes and roads that should uh, be fixed. We call ourselves the most modern, sophisticated economy in uh, the world. And in one of our 150 largest cities, kids are having their IQ depressed because there's lead in uh, the water. New York is supposed to be the greatest city and the greatest country in the world. People come to New York from all over the world. How many people in this room think the United States should be proud of Kennedy or LaGuardia or Newark airports? So for a country to, that can borrow at 1% real, that's a high estimate, to, um, for 30 years, to be investing more in infrastructure at a moment when it's investing at near record low levels on a net basis seems to me about as obvious as anything in public policy should be. Now, there are a hundred questions at uh, the next level. Uh, what's the right role of the public sector in it? What's the right role of the private sector? It's always struck me as kind of extraordinary that socialist Europe has a much larger fraction of its infrastructure, think about airports, for example, owned by the private sector, than capitalist America. It has to be some kind of commentary on the American political process to do a uh, comparison. There's this country that's got a legendary reputation for real great efficiency on things that involve labor. It's called France. They built an underground. Their underground in Paris cost one-fifth as much per mile as the Second Avenue subway in New York. That suggests that there are a lot of issues around figuring out how to do it better uh, in uh, the United States. I always like telling the story of some of you have been on the Harvard campus. There's a bridge that connects the main campus with Boston where uh, the business school is. The, bis uh, the bridge is 362 feet uh, long. It normally has three lanes of traffic. It had one or two lanes of traffic for 62 months while it was under repair. 62 months. Harvard has a um, classics department, so I inquired how long it took Julius Caesar to build a bridge across the Rhine, and it turns out that he had a span of the Rhine where he wanted to not fix a bridge but build a new bridge that was not 362 feet, it was 2,680 feet, and it took him nine days. <laughs> and so we don't have it together on this, and... I think the people who think that there's a certain number of people who just want to spend money and treat it as pork are right. But the fact that we haven't been good at doing it in the past is not a reason to just let the infrastructure uh, decay uh, even, uh, even more. And I think an important priority for whoever our next president is uh, should be fixing the infrastructure because of the jobs that it'll create 
for uh, an assure for middle class people because of what a decent infrastructure contributes to networking a functioning uh, economy. And frankly, because I think showing that the government can do something competently, effectively, and quickly would be an important contributor to something that's very important, which is revitalizing confidence in public institutions. So let me anticipate a question that uh, several of our audience members have asked uh, throughout the day thus far, uh, and it is, uh, is capitalism uh, fatally broken? We've, we've heard uh, so many protest groups on both the, the right and the left uh, say, <clears throat> you know, these elites of ours just, just can't pull it together. The whole system is out of sync. Uh, indeed, uh, some would point to the rise of, of uh, uh, some of the wings of the... Uh, newly elected uh, Congress as uh, evidence of a new um, political thrust in the country. Uh, what, uh, what's your take on the, the broken issue, and, and were you to say that the current system is uh, salvable, um, uh, how do you make that case? So this, so someone I'm going to talk about uh, a theme in the book uh, that I'm writing. I think in important respects, the problems of capitalism are a feature of its success. If you, you've all heard a hundred times that middle class wages have been stagnant. If you look at how many hours it takes to buy a refrigerator, it takes about a third as many as it did in 1973. If you look at how many shirts you can buy with an average day's wages, it's about twice as many as it was in 1973. If you look at how many television sets uh, you can buy, it's about six times as many as you could buy in 1973. If you look at what you can buy in terms of uh, cars, it's about 70% more than it was in 1973. So if you take the stuff that is produced by what we think of as capitalism, companies that hire workers to produce goods, it's like we're really seeing like huge progress in terms of purchasing power. And by the way, the average family under the poverty line, more likely to have a car, more likely to have air conditioning, more likely to have uh, have more television sets, and likely have more space per person in its house, it's the average family under a poverty line, than the median family did when I, when I, when I was uh, growing up. So the stuff that capitalism can do, regular capitalism, is working really well. The problem is, that it, or the challenge is, that it's like what happened to agriculture. Agriculture has worked phenomenally well in the United States. And now it's kind of irrelevant to the economy. Less than 1% of the people work in it. And that's what's happening to traditional capitalist, particularly manufacturing type activities. Today in America, only 4.5% uh, of the workers are doing production work in manufacturing. There are more men on disability than there are doing uh, than there are doing production work, 50-year-old uh, men uh, on disability than there are doing production work in manufacturing, precisely because it's been so productive. And so the problem is what do we do in healthcare? What do we do in education? What do we do in housing where certain locations are very complicated? How do we handle uh, goods that are basically based on platforms uh, like social media. It's the challenges and the things that are hard are not the workings of capitalism. They're the things that are becoming a larger share of our economy and where a larger share of our people are working as capitalism succeeds. And that's the challenge of uh, economic policy uh, for the next generation. And you can't think about health care the way you think about uh, the market uh, 
for uh, shirts. You can't think about taking care of the aged the way you think about uh, the market uh, for automobiles. So is, is, is traditional capitalism enough? No. But is somehow rejecting traditional capitalism uh, the right answer? I don't think there's much evidence in support of uh, that uh, proposition. And if you look at the extant experiments uh, in doing it in Venezuela, in Cuba, in North, uh, in North Korea, uh, they're not enormously appealing. Um, and, you know, a lot of ways of reading uh, the Chinese experience, and there's a lot of complexity, but anyone who looks at it thoughtfully has to say, that broad brush, the reason China has done phenomenally well over the last 40 years is that there are a lot more markets, there's a lot more property, and there's a lot more openness to the rest of the world than there used to be. And so I don't see anything uh, in the record that would support a judgment that somehow capitalism uh, is a bad idea which is in no way to embrace uh, the current status quo. Thank you very much. On that note, uh, we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Please raise your hands so that uh, our uh, runners with the microphones can, can get to you. Uh, <coughs> we'll, we'll take them two at a time, please. <coughs> Dr. Summers, thank you uh, for your really brilliant remarks. My name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a private sector and capital markets advisor. I posed this question in an earlier session and was asked to defer until later to <laughs> ask you. <laughs> do you know or do you think Secretary Paulson or anybody involved with the first $700 billion TARP bill uh, for which there was a considerable amount of chuckling this morning as it was described as a two- to three-page piece of uh, uh, paper, ever gave thought to the fact that they were giving um, fresh capital to money center banks, which had leveraged themselves to an extent that was unsustainable and uh, unacceptable by the comptroller of the currency, and that when they were this given... This a question the, or a polemic? The, when they were given this, this money... This a question or a polemic? I, beg, it, it, I inquired whether you were asking a question or making a or offering us a polemic. I'm offering you a polemic that's that's well, punctuated with a question. Okay, maybe we can get to the punctuation. You know, I had this vision in my head of you portraying the president of Harvard University in the social capital, confronted by the Winklevoss twins, and was hoping that you'd be more merciful with me than asking me what else I should have been doing <laughs> while I was thinking up this question. Um, uh, the banks took the money and shored up their tier one capital. It came in the front door, but it never went out the back door, and it starved the capital markets of liquidity at a moment when they should have had it. Did anyone think about that? Look, there are, the answer to the question, did people think very hard about what the consequences would be for lending, what the best way to economize on taxpayer resources is? Of course. Was the design everything that it could have been? I think I said uh, battlefield medicine uh, is uh, is never perfect, but was the broad strat was the broad strategy the capital needed to be infused uh, into uh, into those insti into those institutions uh, a correct one? Uh, yes, that strategy that strategy uh, was. A, uh, was a correct one. I think the best available evidence, and you know, scholars will uh, debate this, is that if you look at the limited flow of credit in 2009, it had more to do with the lack of demand for credit in a crunched economy than it had to do with the lack of supply of credit. And that if your hypothesis were right, one would see very large spreads between the cost at which banks could borrow and the amount that borrowers had to pay banks because there was this terrific shortage of capital. 
and the available evidence suggests that that was not uh, the dominant pattern. Hank Wallace of Write and Speak Like the News. Harvard P President Emeritus Summers, if you had to do it over again, is there a way that you could continue to ask your hard-hitting questions with total intellectual integrity, free inquiry, while minimizing the hurt, reasonable or unreasonable, according to whom the, the person who says they're hurt says they're hurt? Uh, and of course, I'm referring to your free really inquiry about Q gender period. and quantitative um, skill. Look, I think I've said, uh, I think I've said, I think I've said many times uh, that I'm very proud of all that was accomplished at uh, Harvard during my five years as uh, president. That I think, in some very important respects, uh, strengthened uh, Harvard and made an important contribution, made important contributions uh, to the world. And I think a spirit of rigor and openness in intellectual inquiry was an important part of that. And I've also said uh, that there are a variety of things that with the benefit of hindsight, I would have approached uh, in uh, different ways and uh, expressed myself uh, differently. And with the benefit of hindsight, uh, I uh, wish that I had. That's probably about as much as I'm going to say uh, at an economics forum about uh, my time at my time at Harvard. Thank you. Uh, question over here, and we'll have uh, time for one other question. I do believe. Uh, my name is David LeBlanc. <clears throat> I'm at the University of Virginia. Do you mind entertaining a financial crisis question? Sure. So, <laughs> so I'm I, I'm wondering if you can reflect from your perspective, uh, uh, both at the IMF and your time at Treasury. Uh, about the relationship between the executive and the central bank. Uh, you know, during the financial crisis, we knew, we, we knew what Bernanke was doing, or at least we thought that we knew what Bernanke was doing from the perspective of the public. Today, we see increased uh, amount of conflict, at least coming from, or belligerence, I should say, coming from the executive directed towards uh, the central bank. And I'm wondering if you can talk about your view of, of how markets respond to the kind of bellicose language that either could have occurred during 2008, 2009, and that we are seeing today. You know, there were people during, the, there were people in the political side of the operation uh, at certain moments during the Clinton administration who thought it would be a good idea to offer negative commentary on how high interest rates were and how the central bank should make them lower. And what Bob Rubin and I told them was uh, that it was a fool's game because the central bank wouldn't listen, so it wouldn't reduce short-term interest rates, and the public and markets would listen and get worried about inflation, and so it would increase long-term interest rates, and so it was a kind of counterproductive thing for them to do with respect to their aspiration. And for the most part, overwhelmingly, during the Clinton administration, they found that to be sensible advice um, because it was. And I think what the president's doing uh, in terms of his objectives is counterproductive if you think his objective is to sort of influence the path of interest rates, if you think the objective is to give him a story in the event that the economy turns downwards to escape blame, maybe he's laying some kind of predicate uh, for uh, that uh, kind of strategy. I think that in my experience, um, both in dealing with a range of international financial crises in Mexico, in Asia, in Russia during the 1990s and dealing with the global financial crisis in many ways centered on the United States in uh, uh, 2009 and 2010, there is close respectful cooperation between the administration and uh, the central bank. 
uh, in making judgments about what's going to be done and in figuring out how respective responsibilities are going to be carried out. And I think that's as it should be. I think that, if anything, that we probably should have a little allowance in our system for more respectful cooperation between uh, the central bank uh, and the Treasury. I was struck during the uh, period of the 2009 financial crisis that simultaneously the Fed was engaged in what was called quantitative easing, which basically took the form of issuing short-term financial instruments and buying long-term financial instruments so that the maturity of the debt would be shorter and long-term interest rates would be lower. And literally at the same point that that was happening, the Treasury was announcing that it was reorganizing its debt management to issue more long-term bonds so that it could take advantage of low interest rates. And presumably the people who were getting rich were the dealers in the middle of this. And if the Treasury and the Fed had coordinated on one, mon on one debt management policy for America, I think we would have had a better set of policy alignment. So my thinking about this, and they're similar, there's more complexity than I'll talk about here, uh, that goes to uh, when interest rates are zero, the distinction between what's money and what's a bond gets a little metaphysical. And so there are issues as to how to think about Treasury central bank responsibility then. But I actually think the cutting edge of where there needs to be thought um, would go to respectful cooperation in a range of particular circumstances. But I think the kind of public bashing in which the president uh, is engaged, it's hard to see how that's uh, constructive or productive. Um, I am conscious that we've come to the end of our time. Um, and Give us one more question. Uh, okay. Uh, down in front, uh, Mr. Conti, Professor. So Peter, Con Peter Conti Brown from the Wharton School. You've uh, been on the record recently to be quite critical of stress tests and stress testing regime uh, for large banks. And according to Tim Geithner's memoir on journalism at the time, you were quite critical in spring 2009 about – the, the SCAP stress test as it was unrolled. So my question is, this, is it just a doomed enterprise from the beginning? Are there good and bad versions of it? And what do you make of the recent changes about, uh, about stress tests, tests, both in the Congress and at the Fed? I think one needs to distinguish between uh, the concept of stress tests and the execution of stress tests. I think the concept of stress tests that you want banks not just to be robust right now, but you want to think that they'll be robust if bad things happen is exactly right and is exactly important. And that's what I've always thought. I think it's important that you have a realistic assessment of – what a bad scenario would be. And you also have a realistic assessment of what would happen to a central bank, to a bank, to a bank, if that bad uh, scenario materialized. And the nature of the rather vigorous discussions we engaged in, in and I think ultimately they got to a very constructive place, in the spring of 2009 uh, was my reminding people that um, the stress tests were being designed by central bank staff who had been confident that all was well in May of 2008 and urging that there therefore be more contemplation of really bad scenarios and more contemplation than in any given scenario, there would be very bad surprises. With respect to the stress tests we've had in recent years, 
if you read the press release of the most recent one, and I apologize for not having it cleanly in my mind, but what I'm going to say, I'm 98% certain if you go back and read the press release, you will think leaves the correct impression, that it will say that imagine a scenario in which the stock market falls by 60%, in which the unemployment rate reaches 10%, in which house prices decline nationwide by twice as much as they did during the 2009 crisis. And imagine that uh, commercial real estate prices do substantially worse than they did during the 2009 crisis. The conclusion is that every, bank, every major financial institution in America – will be able to pay all of its dividends in full, raise no capital, and suffer only a decrement of 1% or 2% in its capital ratio. And that strikes me on the basis of history as an extremely unlikely conclusion for an honestly calculated capital ratio. And I would cite as evidence for my belief the fact that one measure of capital is the market value on the stock market of a bank's equity. And we know something about how bank stocks return, respond to declines in the stock market, the so-called beta of banks. And it suggests that uh, the decline in their capital would be more like 80%. Um, and so the conclusion that every bank would very comfortably survive a catastrophe of that margin uh, seems to me to be a very unlikely one that, in all honesty, I have to say, says more about the credibility of the regulators doing the test than it does about the credibility of the financial institutions in question. That doesn't mean that if you didn't do any test, it would be better, be even worse. That doesn't mean that it isn't constructive to have the idea of uh, stress uh, of stress testing. That doesn't mean that the only thing you should rely on is the stock market. God knows it sometimes gets predictions uh, wrong. But do we, do we really believe that... Uh, the day unemployment hits uh, 10%, the Dow hits 10,000, and housing prices across America are down 20%, that no, no major financial institution in the United States will have any question about its capital? And if that isn't something that's plausible, why does the central bank of the United States each year announce that that's true? And that's why I'm uncomfortable with the current state of the way stress testing is being carried out. But I want to be very clear that my objection is not to stress testing. What I'm talking about would not be helped if somehow we stopped doing stress testing. But it's – and I'm not even – I even think that, you know, I hope my house would stand up to – a once every 50 years flood, but I imagine if Boston has a once every thousand years flood that something bad might happen to my house, and you know, it's just part of like the risks of life. So I'm not even saying that we need to have a bank. I think it's probably okay that if we have a catastrophe of that magnitude, banks will have to stop paying their dividends, and banks will have to raise capital. That's probably okay too. But I just think we shouldn't say things that and certainly regulators shouldn't say things that seem at least uh, to be highly implausible. And that's my view on stress tests. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Larry Summers. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.